right, Ninja Nerds, in this video, we're going to talk about the midbrain. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and get started about talking about the midbrain. So what we're going to be doing in this video is we're going to talk about the midbrain, right? We're going to look primarily at cross sections or transverse sections. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second of the midbrain. But we're going to look at it at two levels, okay? One is going to be the one over here on the left, and that's going to be at the level of the inferior colliculus, right? The other cross section is going to be the one here on the right that we'll look at in a little bit, and that's going to be the level of the superior colliculus. Let me explain that just a little bit so we have an idea of orientation. I'm going to draw a sagittal section here, right? So here we're going to have the, obviously the cerebrum, our midbrain, right? So bring our midbrain down, we got our pons, we got our medulla, and then we have a part of the spinal cord, right? And then if you guys want for like simplicity's sake, we got here the cerebellum, right? Well, if you guys remember here, this is going to be the anterior portion. This portion here is going to be the anterior portion, right, of the midbrain. And then back here is going to be the posterior portion of the midbrain or the dorsal. So you can say ventral portion or anterior portion, posterior dorsal portion of the midbrain. On the dorsal portion, you're going to have like these little knobbies that are just hanging out in the back here. Okay, these are called your colliculi, right? So you'll have the one above here, which is your superior colliculus, and then the one below, which is your inferior colliculus, right? So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking cross sections, and we're going to take a cross section here at the inferior colliculus, look at all the internal structures, and then we're going to take a cross section here at the superior colliculus, and that's going to be on the right here, and look at all the internal structures. And then after we're done with that, we'll talk about some of the relative function of a lot of these internal structures, okay? Let's go ahead and get started on that. All right, so now we're looking at that cross section, like we said, right? So this is the cross section at what level? The inferior colliculus, right? Inferior colliculus, we're gonna talk about all the structures and we're gonna kind of annotate them, right? First, what are their names, okay? And kind of their overall like anatomical uh, positioning. And then after we kind of get that down, then we'll go through some other diagrams to give you guys different views on their function. So first thing, this portion here, this green portion, this green portion here, this is going to be on the ventral portion of the midbrain to give you guys some anatomical orientation. Back here, these two bumps in the back, that's your inferior colliculi. That's going to be that dorsal portion of the midbrain, okay? So ventral, dorsal. On the ventral portion here, we have some very important structures that I need you guys to remember here. These guys here, okay, this whole component here in this anterior portion, I'm going to kind of make it like this. See this thing right there? That whole chunk there of this green portion is called the crus cerebri. And if I were to give you kind of just one sentence, kind of one simple thing of what the function of this is, this is where the descending pathways are moving. What's descending? Descending pathways are motor pathways. So they're for motor movement, right? So muscle activity. Now, there's three subdivisions within this crus cerebri that we have to know. The most medial portion here, right? So the most medial portion, this is consisting of what's called the corticopontine fibers. Remember, that's coming from the cortex down to the pons. But you know what part of the cortex is actually coming from? The frontal lobe. So we call these frontopontine fibers. Frontopontine fibers, this medial portion. Now, let's go to the, the middle portion. The middle portion is very important. This is where the corticospinal fibers are moving through. And one more, corticonuclear. So two fibers here, corticospinal and corticonuclear fibers are running through this middle portion, okay? Corticospinal, simplistic way. Neurons from the cortex going down to the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord to go out to the muscles. Corticonuclear or corticobulbar is neurons in the cortex going down to the cranial nerve nuclei, such as three, four, six, so on and so forth, okay? So corticonuclear, corticospinal is in this middle portion here. The most outer or lateral portion of these crust cerebri here is going to be made up of other corticopontine fibers. But these corticopontine fibers are not coming from the frontal lobe, they're coming from almost all the other ones. So what are the other ones? The temporal, what else? Parietal, what else? Occipital, pontine fibers, 
Okay? So again, you have the temporal, parietal, occipital, and pontine fibers. Really quick point, simplest way I can make it, very important clinically. The corticospinal corticonuclear fibers. The reason why I'm kind of emphasizing so much on this is if you guys remember, you can have like a little homunculus, like a little man, and it kind of gives areas of the body that a certain pathway might supply based upon the, the region of the body. I want you to remember at the most medial portion here, the most medial portion of these kind of corticospinal corticonuclear fibers, this is gonna supply more of the head. Even a little bit of the frontopontine fibers do that. As you go more laterally through this middle chunk, you're gonna start supplying the trunk. As you get down towards like the outer portion of this corticospinal and the corticonuclear pathway, it'll start going more to the lower extremities, okay? So here's what I want you to remember, this little homunculus, little stick figure that I'm drawing here. This kind of gives us, relatively, the fibers that are in this middle, the medial portion of this middle chunk supplies more of the upper body. The middle might supply more of the trunk, and then this lateral portion or outer portion of that middle chunk might supply the lower extremities. So if there is a lesion, for example, involving only this portion here, it might only involve the muscles of the head. If it's involving this portion, it might involve the muscles of the trunk. If it's involving this portion, it might involve muscles of the lower extremities. That's the importance and significance I want you guys to take home. All right, good. We got the ventral portion of the midbrain. The next portion we have to talk about is we're gonna cover all of this stuff between the inferior colliculus and the crust cerebri. You know what that's called? This whole chunk here, from this point all the way forward, from here all the way to this point here, is called the tegmentum. It's called the tegmentum. And there is a bunch of stuff in the tegmentum, so much stuff in the tegmentum. What are some of the things that we're gonna talk about? Okay, let's first move on to this structure. You see this structure? Almost everybody in science knows this structure. This is the substantia nigra. Substantia nigra, everybody knows that this is what's basically damaged, it leads to Parkinson's disease, right? Well, there's two components of the substantia nigra, this dark component. This dark component is called the pars compacta. Okay, so the pars compacta. Pars compacta is the dark dopaminergic producing neurons. Can't stress that enough. This is the ones that produce dopamine. This lighter colored one, this guy is called the pars reticularis. And the pars reticularis is the gabergic producing neurons. They release GABA, gamma amino butric acid. Combined, both of the pars compacta and the pars reticularis make up the substantia nigra. Okay? All right, so the next thing we have to do is cover some of these ascending pathways, right? So the ascending pathways are the sensory pathways, right? They're carrying fine touch, discriminative touch, pressure, proprioception, pain, temperature, all of that stuff. And even auditory sensations. They're all being carried through these purple fibers here. Okay, so we're gonna cover them each individually starting from medial and kind of working our way laterally and then dorsally, right? So first one here just behind the substantia nigra, this guy is called the medial lemniscus. Now a lot of you guys, if you guys have watched a lot of our videos in um, the neurology playlist, we've already talked about the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway. We'll briefly go over that a little bit later. But this is a sensory pathway, right? For proprioception, fine and discriminative touch, okay, and even vibratory sensations. The next one, as we go a little bit more dorsally, right, is the trigeminal lemniscus. So this is the trigeminal lemniscus. Now the trigeminal lemniscus is important because this one is taking sensations from the face, right? So more of proprioceptive sensations, touch sensations, pressure sensations. These are going to be a part of that part of uh, this ascending system. Go a little bit more back. This is the spinal lemniscus. The spinal lemniscus is important because this one is carrying uh, ascending fibers from that pain and temperature and even crude touch and pressure sensations from your anterior and lateral spinothalamic tract. 
and even a little bit from the spinal tectal pathway. So again, medial lemniscus, trigeminal lemniscus, spinal lemniscus, and the most outer one or lateral portion here is the lateral lemniscus. So many lemnus guys, right? So lateral lemniscus, simple way, one sentence kind of thing, is it's involved with your auditory pathway. So from the vestibulocochlear nerve, the cochlear part though, okay? All right, so the next thing that we got to talk about here is let's go into the middle portion of the tegmentum. So we've already kind of covered some of the outer portions. Let's go into the middle and then kind of like work our way through all of these structures. Big couple structures here, okay? You see this guy here, this pink nuclei here? Okay, they're actually kind of around the, the periaqueductal gray matter and kind of a part of it. But to kind of keep it separate and make it more simplified, we got these pink nuclei that are a part of that periaqueductal gray matter. You know what this guy is called? It is called the, we're going to have kind of these little key out here so we don't get our diagram all crazy, but it's called the locus ceruleus. Locus ceruleus. You guys know this locus ceruleus is where most of the noradrenergic neurons are produced, so they're responsible for releasing large amounts of noroepinephrine. Remember this when we talked about the descending pain pathway? This is involved within the descending pain modulation pathway, right? So they, they basically release norepinephrine that inhibits some specific pain pathways. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but if you guys haven't already, you guys can watch our video on that. We have a video on the descending pain pathway. All right, go a little bit more anterior. A little bit more anterior, we have another group of neurons that are also involved in the descending pain pathway. You see these green guys here? We're gonna kind of look at them right here. This is called the dorsal raphe nucleus. So the dorsal raphe nucleus. So again, I want you guys to remember both the locus ceruleus and the dorsal raphe nucleus are involved in the descending pain pathway. Sweet deal. Let's move a little bit more ventral. You see these guys here? These maroon colored guys? These maroon colored guys here is the mesencephalic nucleus of the trigeminal nerve, right? So this is the mesencephalic nucleus of cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve. You guys remember the trigeminal nu nucleus? It extends all the way from the midbrain all the way down to the medulla. Well, this is the portion of the trigeminal nucleus that is in the midbrain. There's gonna be one in the pons, there's gonna be one in the medulla. Again, this guy picks up some of that proprioceptive information, right, from the trigeminal nerve. So the proprioceptive information is the basically the position sense of our muscles and our tendons and our joints from those mas mastication muscles and basically sends it to these nuclei which relay that up through the trigeminal meniscus, right? So you see kind of the connection there. All right, next one. We go and cover some of this structure here. So we have this central structure here. There's this little tube little tube here with some actual fluid in it, right? That little tube with the fluid in it, the cerebral spinal fluid, is called the cerebral aqueduct. So again, we're going to kind of bring it out here. So the little tube with the blue stuff in it is called the cerebral aqueduct. Now, if you guys remember, the cerebral aqueduct is the little tube that connects what? Above it is the third ventricle. Below it is the fourth ventricle. So it's connecting the two fluid-filled spaces in the central nervous system, which again, superior is the third ventricle, inferior is the fourth ventricle. So cerebral aqueduct. Now, all of this kind of like gray matter surrounding it is called the periaqueductal, periaqueductal gray matter. I want you to remember that. So all of this kind of stuff surrounding the cerebral aqueduct is called the periaqueductal gray matter. So we have the cerebral aqueduct and around it is the periaqueductal gray matter. Sweet, let's move on to the next thing. So now we have these next group of fibers here. And this next group of fibers here are located within just anterior to this periaqueductal gray matter. And this is called the medial longitudinal fasciculus. So again, here we have these blue dots here. This is called the medial longitudinal fasciculus. You guys know this. We talked about this with the vestibulocochlear nerve. 
This is basically connecting the vestibular nuclei, which is in that pons medulla junction, to what three cranial nerve nuclei? Three, four, and six. It's basically responsible for helping to accommodate proper eye movements based upon vestibular sensations, right? Like whenever we're rotating our head to the left or rotating our head to the right, okay? So again, medial longitudinal fasciculus is a ascending kind of uh, pathway, white fibers, white matter, right? That are connecting the third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerve nuclei together. All right, move a little bit more anterior. We have these blue fibers, okay? And again, a lot of this is all ascending fibers. These blue fibers here are gonna be a part of your tectospinal fibers. So again, this is going to be the tecto spinal fibers and we will get into a little bit more detail on what the heck the tectum is in just a second all right simplistically one sentence kind of thing tecto spinal fibers are basically taking information from your tectum and we'll talk about that in a second what that is and it's taking that down and sending that information to your spinal cord to control muscle movement what kind of muscles primarily muscles of the eyes and muscles of the neck the whole purpose here is what I want you to remember is that the tectum is going to be made up of two structures here, the superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus. Simplistic way to remember, superior colliculus receives visual input, okay? Inferior colliculus receives auditory input. So whenever we're following or tracking something, what are we doing? If I'm following somebody moving, I'm moving my head and my eyes in that direction. Who does that? Superior colliculus. If I hear someone yelling my name and I look towards that, I fix my gaze and I move my head towards that direction, who's responsible for that? The inferior colliculus. And guess who controls that? The tectospinal fibers, okay? All right, next one. These red fibers here, these red fibers are, uh, again, these are descending fibers and this is via the rubrospinal pathway. So the rubrospinal pathway, these are gonna be taking fibers from the red nucleus going down to the lower motor neurons and controlling motor movement, primarily of the flexor muscles and the distal extremities. So we have here the rubrospinal fibers or the tract, right? So the rubrospinal tract. Okay, sweet. Again, rubrospinal, red nucleus. We'll talk about that in a second. That's at the level of the superior colliculus. It's going to send descending fibers that are going to go to flexor muscles. One more structure to cover here that covers the tegmentum. And this is this little kind of like lattice crossing structure here all the way in the ventral portion. This right here is called the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles. That is one heck of a thing to say, right? So we have here in the front, this little lattice like structure here. We have the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles. All right, sweet deal. Now, what the heck do these things do? Simplest thing I want you to remember, again, we'll go into a little bit more detail of it later. This is going to be consisting of fibers coming from the cerebellum, moving through the superior cerebellar peduncles, and they're gonna to go to two structures. One is they're gonna to go to the red nucleus, which is a, a level above, right, the superior colliculus. And then from the red nucleus, it can go up to the thalamus, which is in the diencephalon. So these fibers are connecting the cerebellum to the red nucleus or cerebellum to the thalamus. And eventually what that's gonna to lead to is it's gonna send fibers up to the cortex. Because remember, what's the cerebellum doing? It's involved in kind of helping us unconsciously to play a role within coordination, posture, tone of the muscles, all of that stuff. So it sends up a motor plan to the cerebral cortex with the exact calculated way that we should move. So, decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles is gonna be fibers, ascending fibers, that are coming from the cerebellum, contralateral, so they're crossing over, going up to the contralateral red nucleus, or contralateral thalamus to the cortex, okay? So last thing I want you guys to remember here when it comes to kind of just, because sometimes they can ask this in exam questions, if I take the crust cerebri and the tegmentum, does that make up something? Yes, 
The crust cerebri and the tegmentum collectively make up what's called the cerebral peduncles. So again, I want you to remember that what are the cerebral peduncles? The cerebral peduncles are a combination of the tegmentum and the crust cerebri. Okay, a couple more things here. One of the other things that is gonna be coming out of the midbrain, but it's in this area of the tegmentum, is a cranial nerve. What is that cranial nerve that's at the infracolliculus level? This is one of the only cranial nerves that actually crosses. You know what this cranial nerve is? This is the trochlear nerve. So the trochlear nerve, or also known as cranial nerve four. So cranial nerve four, or the trochlear nerve, is going to be a motor nerve. It carries motor sensations to the extraocular muscle of the eye. And what is that actual muscle called? That muscle is called the superior oblique. And if you guys remember, we've covered all of these cranial nerves in more detail in their, se their separate videos, but this is the muscle that kind of does opposite of what you would think. So superior oblique actually causes what? It causes inferior movement of the eye. So it actually causes kind of depression of the eye, but it also rotates the eye inward and we call that intorsion. So it does inferior movement and kind of rotates the eye medially and that causes this intorsion type of movement. Okay, so superior oblique. Now, last thing that we have to talk about is this posterior portion here. If I were to kind of do like one of these little thingamajiggies, I kind of make like a little dotted line here. Now this is separating the tegmentum from this last structure here. This last structure, which is primarily only consisting of the colliculi, is called the tectum but one of the components of the tectum is the inferior colliculus, right? So we have the inferior colliculus at this level, and the inferior colliculus is a part of your tectum. But again, remember, the tectum is made up of two colliculi. And what are those two colliculi? It is the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. Okay, so again, you have to remember, posterior portion here, if we were to kind of jot down what this posterior portion is called anatomically, this portion is called the tectum. But again, you gotta remember that the tectum is made up of the superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus, okay? That covers all of the internal structures of this part of the midbrain at the level of the inferior colliculus. Now let's go ahead and talk about the internal structures at the superior colliculus. Then what we'll do is we'll kind of tie together all the kind of general functions of these internal structures. All right, so we covered the midbrain cross section at the inferior colliculus. But what I want to do now is cover that cross section or that transverse cut, but at the superior colliculus level. Okay. So a lot of this is going to be kind of like a recap really quick, right? So again, what is this anterior portion? Yell it out guys. This is the crust cerebri. What does it consist of? Medially frontopontine, right? In the middle is corticospinal and cortico nuclear fibers. And then the lateral portion is going to be the uh, the cortical pontine, but particularly from the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, right? And again, from medial, it's going to be supplying the muscles of the head. Towards the middle portion, it'll be supplying portions of the trunk and upper extremities. And the outer portion of this middle trunk here is supplying the lower extremities, right? Here we have the substantia nigra, consisting of the pars compacta, pars reticularis, pars compacta releases dopamine, pars reticularis releases GABA, right? Here we have the medial lemniscus, the trigeminal lemniscus, and the spinal lemniscus. But what's gone? Did you guys notice something was missing? The lateral lemniscus. And we're going to explain a little bit more why later. The lateral lemniscus ends or terminates at the level of the inferior colliculus. We'll explain that a little bit later when we get into another diagram. So again, that's gone. So at the level of the superior colliculus, what's gone? The lateral lemniscus. But you still have medial, trigeminal, and spinal. Okay, now let's come back towards the center. What do we have here? Well, we still have that mesencephalic nucleus of the trigeminal nerve, right? And again, that was picking up proprioceptive information from the mastication muscles. We still have the cerebral aqueduct, which is connecting the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. We still have the periaqueductal gray matter. We still have the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which is connecting the vestibular nuclei to the 
third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerve nuclei. So a lot of this is recap, right? So what here is different in the tegmental area? What's different in the tegmental area is you notice these big red nuclei structures with a crossing. Okay, remember I told you we had the red nucleus at the level of the superior colliculus. And at the level of the inferior colliculus, we had those descending rubrospinal fibers. So guess what this guy is? This is the red nucleus that's in the tegmentum. And when it crosses, it crosses right away. And it's crossing in the ventral part of the tegmentum, right? Because again, from here all the way till here is the tegmentum. This is the ventral portion of the midbrain, dorsal portion of the midbrain. So the red nucleus, when it crosses at that level of the superior colliculus, it forms a decussation. What is that decussation called? It is called the ventral tegmental decussation. All right, and that's gonna help us to understand that once this decussates and moves down through the area of the inferior colliculus, what is it gonna move into? Those rubrospinal fibers, beautiful. Let's move a little bit back. Now back here, you have these blue fibers here. What was that in the other diagram at the inferior colliculus level? That was the tectospinal fibers. Now remember, tectospinal fibers, what is the tectum made up of? Superior colliculus and inferior colliculus. The tectospinal fibers technically start at the level of the superior colliculus. So what happens is, this is our superior colliculus here. The superior colliculus gives fibers, and what it does is it moves ventrally. So from the dorsal part of the midbrain, it moves ventrally. And as it moves ventrally, it crosses, okay? And when it crosses, it then moves downwards. So then it's going to start moving downwards towards the inferior colliculus level. When it moves downwards, it forms those tectospinal fibers. So here's what I want you to remember. This portion here of the, the actual midbrain where the tectospinal fibers are just starting to originate and then cross. That is called the dorsal tegmental decussation. So let's write that over here. Let's write it right here. So again, we're gonna have our superior colliculus here. And then what happens with those superior colliculi? What do they do again? They cross. And then they move down as the tectospinal fibers or tectospinal tract. This portion here, where they decussate, is called the dorsal tegmental decussation. And then they will move down as the tectospinal fibers or tract, which we saw on the inferior colliculus level. Sweet deal. Okay. So we've covered a lot of these structures so far. So we hit this one, we hit this one, we already talked about the medial longitudinal fasciculus in the other video. We got this brown neuron here. What is this guy? Okay, this guy here, this brown neuron, is a cranial nerve. You guys remember what cranial nerve is at the superior colliculus level? It is the oculomotor nerve. So this nerve here, this is the oculo motor nerve. What cranial nerve is that? You guys got to remember that. That's cranial nerve three. This is really important to remember. A lot of lesions that are involved can in involve this level of the colliculus. I'm sorry, this, this level of the midbrain of the superior colliculus. So again, oculomotor nerve. Oculomotor nerve, if you guys remember from the video that we covered this, this carries motor fibers, but it's somatic motor fibers. So that's only controlling skeletal muscle. So this carries what's called general somatic efferent fibers, okay? There's a nucleus that's also really important, which is associated with this oculomotor nerve. And it's these green fibers. You see these green fibers that are this nuclei here and it's moving with the oculomotor nerve? This guy has one heck of a name. So these green ones up here, this is called the Edinger Westfall nucleus. And this is going to be primarily carrying what kind of fibers? Parasympathetic fibers. Can't stress that enough. So parasympathetic nervous system fibers. But these can go to visceral components. They can go to smooth muscle. 
okay? They can go to other different structures. Glands, so because of that, this is general visceral efferent fibers. So again, these fibers are general visceral efferent fibers. So we have the edinger westphal nucleus and the oculomotor nerve, okay? These are gonna be controlling a lot of the eye movements as well as pupil constriction with the edinger westphal nucleus and accommodation of the lens for near vision. All right, sweet deal. We covered that guy. One more thing that's a little bit different here, and this, this, this baby blue kind of guy here. This baby blue guy we talked about in the visual pathway in the pupillary light reflex video, and this guy is called the pretectal nucleus. That should make perfect sense. Because again, if I were to draw that imaginary line back here, what is this portion back here? The tectum, right? Consisting of the superior colliculus at this level and then below at the inferior colliculus. Just in front of it, pre, is the pretectal nuclei. The pretectal nuclei are important in the, the actual pupillary light reflex. So this is the pretectal nucleus. And what do they do? Again, what happens is they receive sensory information from the eyeball, right from the optic nerve. And what happens is from the optic nerve, you get this structure called the lateral geniculate nucleus or the lateral geniculate body. And from that, fibers can go into the supicoliculus and go to this pretectal nuclei. And what it does is, is it provides stimulation to bilateral edinger westphal nucleus. And then these edinger westphal nuclei will stimulate these axons to go out to the ciliary ganglion and control pupillary movement. What kind of things? If you shine a light in somebody's eye, what happens? That pupil constricts. Right? But because in the edinger westphal nucleus, it stimulates both sides. So if I stimulate the right and the left pupil by shining a light in, let's say, someone's right eye, they're going to constrict the right pupil and the left pupil. So that gives you direct and your consensual light response. So that's the job of the pretectal nucleus. It allows for that direct and consensual light response. Beautiful. Okay. We covered that last portion here. So again, we covered the crust cerebri. We call it, covered all the parts of the tegmentum. Last thing is a part of the tectum, which is the, we already should know this, the superior colliculus. So right back here in the tectum is your superior colliculus. Now the superior colliculus, we already kind of described a very simple thing about it. Remember, this receives visual information from the retina, from parts of the cortex, like your frontal eye field, and your actual visual cortex in the occipital lobe. It receives that information. Guess what else it receives information from? From your sensory system, right? And it basically coordinates that to help us to play a role with, what do we say? Tracking a moving object or something of that nature, right? So moving our head and our eyes with the object that we're following, okay? So that is the job of the superior colliculus. Now, we covered all the internal structures. What I want to talk about now is just the basic function of all of these internal structures. We've already covered all of these things in great detail in separate videos. Let's get a general overview. We talked about all these internal structures. And it's good to just know these things. Obviously, it's important to know these structures, their names and their location, but it's also really important to just have a general overview of what these things do. And we've already talked a lot about some of these pathways in more detail that you guys can talk about. And we'll actually, I'll refer to that as we go along. So let's kind of get a general overview, not gonna go into crazy detail in every single thing, just an overall function of all of these different structures. Okay, let's start here with this diagram. This diagram, we're gonna cover the lateral lemniscus. We already talked about that within the cochlear nerve pathway, right? So the auditory pathway. But just to give you guys a little bit of information about it. If you guys remember, we have the vestibulocochlear nerve, right? And it's picking up sensations from the inner ear right? From the spiral organ of corti, if you guys remember. And what happens is that information comes via the vestibulocochlear nerve to the level of the pons medulla junction. And at that kind of like pons medulla junction, if you guys remember, you have a bunch of different nuclei, okay, called cochlear nuclei. And what happens is these vestibulocochlear nerve, it kind of synapses on some of these cochlear nuclei.
And then what happens is they end up kind of crossing into the other side, right? And whenever they cross to the other side, they move up via this structure called the lateral lemniscus. And this lateral lemniscus, guess what it does? It eventually can synapse on the inferior colliculus, which we said was right here. So remember, you have that lateral lemniscus, guess what? It sends its fibers to terminate at the level of the inferior colliculus. That inferior colliculus, guess what it does? After it receives this auditory information, it sends this all the way up to the structure just outside of the thalamus. You guys remember this from the auditory video? This guy is called the medial geniculate nucleus or the medial geniculate body. And then what happens is from here, that'll then get kind of relayed uh, to a part of the thalamus and then that will go to the temporal lobe, right? Where the primary auditory cortex is. You guys remember that, that transverse gyrus of Heschel, right? So that is kind of the overall point of this is that the lateral lemniscus is carrying this sensory auditory pathway to the inferior colliculus and from the inferior colliculus that goes up into the medial geniculate nucleus. And you actually kind of might want to know what this little connection is between the inferior colliculus and the medial geniculate nucleus. This is called the brachium. So they call this the brachium of the inferior colliculus. Okay. So simple thing, not a lot of detail. I just want you guys to get an understanding of what this thing is. Okay. Next thing I want you guys to understand here is remember we said that you have that tectospinal fibers, right? Well, remember we said here that the inferior colliculus, I want you guys to remember, guess what it can do? Not only can it connect via the brachium of the inferior colliculus to the medial geniculate nucleus, but it can also send information to your superior colliculus. Guess what your superior colliculus can do then? If you hear something, your superior colliculus activates that tectospinal pathway and it goes to the motor neurons that supply muscles of your head and your neck. And it also can stimulate cranial nerve nuclei that can help with moving your eyes. So if someone yells, stimulates the inferior colliculus, he tells your superior colliculus, guess what the superior colliculus does? Moves his, your, your neck and your head and your eyes towards that auditory stimulus. Isn't that so cool? So that's the job of this inferior colliculus kind of process. All right, so we talked about the inferior colliculus, kind of a part of that, right? And we talked about this lateral lemniscus. Let's kind of go back here. We're going to take a step here and talk about these corticospinal, corticopontine, corticonuclear fibers. And again, we've already covered all of this in our descending pathways video. But to give you guys a little bit of information, remember, you're going to have these upper motor neurons. And they're going to be kind of situated with different parts of the cortex. Frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe temporal lobe. All of these things are basically going to be your upper motor neurons and they're going to send these fibers down. All right. And so it's going to move obviously through the internal capsule. And then as it moves down through the internal capsule, it's going to go through your midbrain. Right. And remember what we said is these descending fibers will run through the midbrain and we kind of gave a, a clinical uh, or a, a clinical correlation to that. Right. So as these fibers move through the midbrain, you guys remember that what happens? As it moves through the midbrain, it kind of goes down here to the level of the pons. And in the pons, you guys remember, we talked about this in that video, you have a bunch of pontine nuclei, okay? A bunch of pontine nuclei located here. And what happens is some of these cortical fibers may synapse on these cortical pontine nuclei, but some of them may scatter around that, that pon, pontine nuclei and then move re kind of reconnect and then move back down through the medulla where they will decussate at the level of the pyramids and then move into the lateral columns of the spinal cord to go down and you guys remember that it'll stimulate the anterior gray horn right and from the anterior gray horn you'll have these lower motor neurons that will go to your muscles to cause contraction so what I want you guys to remember is the fibers that are going down all the way to your spinal cord these are the cortico spinal fibers. The fibers that may stop along the way and give stimulation to nuclei within the brainstem. Maybe it's a cranial nerve nuclei, 
right? So maybe this is a cranial nerve. Maybe it's like the, the, the red nucleus. Maybe it is the, uh, a, another nucleus within the actual uh, the brain stem. But the fibers that are branching off and giving stimulation to nuclei within the brain stem, those are your corticonuclear or corticobulbar fibers. And then the fibers that are synapsing at the pons are called the corticopontine fibers. And just a very simplistic thing, we talk about it a little bit in that video, but these corticopontine fibers, what do they do? They decussate. And they go via the, you guys remember that structure that's between the uh, pons and the cerebellum? Middle cerebellum peduncles. And it connects to the cerebellum, right? So it'll connect to the cerebellum and tell the cerebellum Here's the motor plane that the cortex set up. Can you receive all the information from the proprioceptors, information from the uh, uh, proprioceptors from there, information from the cortex, information from the basal nuclei, all these things, and make sure that this movement is perfectly coordinated. So that's pretty cool, right? So again, corticospinal, going to the spinal cord, the neurons at that level. Corticonuclear, nuclei within the brainstem. Corticopontine, going to the pons, which will decussate and go to the contralateral cerebellum to make sure that the movement is properly coordinated and perfectly calculated, okay? All right, so we covered this crust cerebri, right? And again, I want you guys, don't forget, don't forget that anatomical orientation or that kind of like homunculus thing, okay? Next thing we gotta talk about is the next part of the tegmentum, that substantia nigra. Remember the substantia nigra? Again, we've already kind of covered this a little bit in the Parkinson's disease video, and we'll have another video discussing more of the basal ganglia. But if you guys remember, what happens is that the substantia nigra has what's called the nigrostriatal pathway, right? So it has fibers that come up here and connect to the striatum. And if you guys remember, what that does is, is it helps to play a role within making sure that the motor movement is properly fine-tuned. It's, it's coordinated perfectly in such a way. And so if you guys remember, it's connected to a structure here within the actual, uh, the central, the, the cerebrum. And this guy is called the lentiform nucleus. So you guys remember the lentiform nucleus. The lentiform nucleus is made up of, you guys remember the putamen and then the globus politis externus and the globus politis internus, right? And then these structures are connected to your thalamus. And there's also interconnections between all of these things and the caudate nucleus. And there's even another structure involved here called the subthalamus. Well, what the substantia nigra does is, and we're not gonna go into all, de all the details in this, but it's involved in two pathways, the direct pathway and the indirect pathway. Remember the direct pathway will basically go to the cortex and help to stimulate motor movement. And the indirect pathway will go up to the cortex and help to inhibit a particular motor movement. What the substantia nigra does is it releases dopamine onto neurons that are involved in the direct pathway and neurons that are involved in the indirect pathway and helps to kind of speed up the intensity of that motor activity. So if you damage these neurons, what happens? You lose that kind of increased kick to the muscles and that can lead to Parkinson's disease, okay? So, again, substantia nigra has a connection via the nigrostriatal pathway to this lentiform nuclei, which is involved in helping you to play a role within very uh, meticulous, fine-tuned kind of motor movements. All right, so we covered, again, the basal ganglia, and it's very simplistic. We're gonna go into more detail on that in another video, and we'll go into way more detail on the direct pathway and indirect pathway and all the glutaminergic and GABAergic neurons and all of stuff like that. But for right now, I just want you guys to get the basic point that the dopamine is released to help to kind of increase that actual motor activity. So next thing let's talk about here is that decussation. So now what we're gonna talk about is that decussation. And we talked about it a little bit. I wanted to kind of make sure I clear you guys' minds up on this completely the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncle. So again, get your anatomy here situated, right? So we have midbrain, pons, medulla, cerebellum, and then we have our spinal cord, right? Well, in the actual cerebellum, you have some nuclei. We talked about this in the cerebellum video. If you guys remember that mnemonic, don't eat greasy food, it's the dentate nucleus, your emboliform nucleus, your globose nucleus, your vestigial nucleus. Primarily the ones that are involved in this, these deep cerebellar nuclei, is that dentate, the globose, and the emboliform. And what do they do? They send fibers here, right? Remember what we said, they send from the cerebellum to what thing? To the contralateral red nucleus. 
So from here, we'll have all of these deep cerebellar nuclei send their motor plan to the contralateral red nucleus. What is the name of these fibers? This is called the uh, cerebellorubral fibers. Now, what can happen is some of these uh, fibers from the red nucleus will move up to the thalamus. Or some of the fibers may go directly from the cerebellum, right, cross over and move to the thalamus. And this would be called cerebellothalamic fibers. So again, you can have cerebellorubrothalamic fibers, cerebellorubral fibers, or cerebellothalamic fibers. And all I want you to remember out of this is that from the deep cerebellar nuclei, and again, cerebellum is important for tone, for coordination, for posture, all of these things, it sends up your kind of like blueprint of the appropriate defined motor movement. How does it get it up to the cortex though? It sends it up via the red nucleus to the thalamus. And then from the thalamus, you can send this up to your motor cortex, or it can go via the cerebellum to the thalamus, and then from the thalamus up to the cortex. So that is what's forming that decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles. Two primary pathways, again, cerebellorubral, and cerebellothalamic, all right? So that is an important thing to remember for this pathway. Another thing that can happen though, is this is actually really cool. Not only can the red nucleus send things upwards, but guess what else it can do? It can send things down and it can send it to a nucleus kind of in the medulla region here called the inferior olives. And if you guys remember the inferior olives, what can they do? they can send these fibers back into the cerebellum, right? So they can send these fibers into the cerebellum. And when they send these fibers into the cerebellum, they come in via the climbing fibers. Remember the climbing fibers and the mossy fibers? And again, this helps to play a role with really helping to coordinate proper motor movement. Okay, so pretty cool here. Again, that decussation is made up of cerebello rubro or cerebello thalamic fibers. All right, guys, so now let's talk about some other stuff. Let's talk about these liminisci, okay? So the liminisci, if you guys remember, we have the medial liminiscus and the trigeminal, the spinal, and we already talked about the, uh, the lateral liminiscus. Again, we're not gonna go into a ton of detail here, but I want you guys to just have an understanding, basic understanding of what this is. Remember that dorsal column, it's picking up sensations, right, from the periphery, from proprioceptors, which could play a role within position of joints and tendons and muscles. It's picking up vibratory sensations, fine and discriminative touch. And it's sending it down this unipolar neuron into the dorsal gray horn, and what does it do? It moves ipsilateral into that dorsal column and then ascends up, right? And if you guys remember, it eventually it comes here to about the, the medulla and you have those nuclei. Again, we're not gonna talk crazy about this, but you have that nucleus cuneatus and the nucleus gracilis. And what happens is these fibers eventually will cross, right? And then move upwards, okay? So again, you have the dorsal column, which is bringing up sensations, right? And when it comes up through the midbrain, it's coming sensations from the contralateral side, actually, because it crosses at the level of the medulla, right? So again, sensations from proprioceptors, from fine and discriminative touch, and from vibrations are coming up via the dorsal column, right? and then synapsing on that nucleus cuneatus and nucleus gracilis, and then coming up via the medial liminiscus through the midbrain. And eventually this will go up to the thalamus and then to the cortex, right? So that's that job. So that's coming up through that midbrain. The other one, which we'll do here, let's just do this one in green for simplicity's sake. Remember we have that trigeminal nucleus here? Remember that trigeminal nucleus here? We have again, the part in the midbrain, which we already talked about, which was the mesencephalic nucleus and then we have a part in the pons, and then we have a part in the actual medulla. Well, remember that this guy picks up sensations, right, from the trigeminal nerve. So sensory sensations will come in via the trigeminal nerve and go to this nucleus, right? So there'll be sensations from the face. This will come to this nucleus, and what this nucleus will do is, it'll give off fibers that are coming from the uh, medulla portion of the trigeminal nucleus, from the pons portion of the trigeminal nucleus and the midbrain portion of the trigeminal nucleus, and it'll move up 
as an ascending tract. And do you guys know what this little green tract is that's moving upwards? This is the trigeminal lemniscus. So again, trigeminal lemniscus. So this is basically picking up sensations from the face, right? So the, the light touch, pain, temperature, proprioception from the mastication muscles and coming into this trigeminal nuclei. From the trigeminal nuclei, it gives off these fibers that ascend upwards as this sensory tract called the trigeminal lemniscus or the trigeminal thalamic tract. And it'll go to the thalamus. The last one that I want you to remember here, let's do this one in red and we're gonna bring it on this side here. This guy is going to be a part of the spinal lemniscus. Spinal lemniscus picks up pain and temperature sensations, right? And it also can pick up light touch and pressure. And what it does is it moves in via the dorsal gray horn, synapses on that neuron there in the dorsal gray horn, and then what does it do? If it's the pain and temperature sensations, what happens? They cross over, right? And then when they cross over, they move up via the lateral. And if it's that kind of crude touch and pressure sensations, that moves into the ventral and eventually kind of comes up. But eventually these two fibers will kind of fuse together. And as they come up, they will come up as a tract. And guess what this tract is called? This is called the spinal lemniscus. So you have the spinal lemniscus, you have the trigeminal lemniscus, and you have the medial lemniscus. So this is just giving you guys a little bit of information, again, about how these tracks are working, what they're carrying, okay? And again, if you guys want more detail on these tracks, go watch our video on these ascending tracks. All right, so now we talked about the kind of the ascending fibers. Let's talk about some other things here. I wanna talk about those, another descending. Remember the locus ceruleus and the dorsal raphae nucleus? Remember we had those guys here kind of situated within the periaqueductal gray matter? Remember these? We kind of drew these a little bit a while ago. We named those, right? Remember that we have that pain pathway. So here, let's draw that same thing here. Let's draw that same thing here. You're gonna have the, these pain fibers, right? They're picking up pains and temperature sensations, moving into the dorsal gray horn, crossing over. And when they cross over, they move upwards via that spinal lemniscus, right? What happens is you are gonna have these structures here. And this is gonna be your locus ceruleus, right? And you have your dorsal raphe nucleus. And what happens is these guys are gonna send down their serotonergic and norepinephrine or noradrenergic fibers downwards. And they're going to synapse at that area, okay, within the dorsal gray horn. If you guys remember back from that video, I'm not gonna write the whole name out here. Ah, what the heck. You guys remember that substantia gelatinosa of Rolando? <laughs> Who comes up with these names? But that's in that Rex lamina, right? The Rex lamina number three in that dorsal gray horn. That's where that substance P is released, right? In that actual, that space. And remember, the substance P is important for that pain pathway. There's substance P and glutamate, which is for your slow and fast pain pathways. Well, remember, the locus ceruleus and the dorsal raphe nucleus come down to this area and they release things like norepinephrine. So they release things like norepinephrine and serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine, which helps to stimulate specific little neurons in that area to inhibit this pain pathway. So whenever there is a painful stimulus, Right, so this guy is going to lead to a painful stimulus to send this up via the spinal lemniscus. This locus ceruleus and dorsal raphe will send down descending fibers to inhibit this pain pathway. So it's like our analgesic system, our endogenous analgesic system. Isn't that so cool? So again, putting a little bit of uh, background behind these structures here. So again, that's the purpose of the, the locus ceruleus and the dorsal raphe nucleus. All right, so let's talk about the next thing. So we kind of finish a lot of the structures pretty much at that inferior colliculus level. Okay, we'll talk about we'll talk about a couple other ones that are pretty much at both levels. But now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this red nucleus, which is at the level of the superior colliculus, right? Okay, so again, superior colliculus level will have this red nucleus. Now, if you guys remember, the red nucleus gets stimulation from a bunch of different areas, right? You can get stimulation from the cortex, and it can get stimulation from the cerebellum. But basically what happens is, when it receives this stimulation, remember what we said, it decussates at that level. 
all right? And it's in the dorsal part, I'm sorry, the ventral part of the tegmentum. So what do we call that decussation? Ventral tegmental decussation. And then what happens is, is it descends downwards and it goes into the columns here, right? So, and then what happens is when it goes into kind of your lateral white columns, it gives off axons to the ventral gray horn and these ventral gray horn neurons will go out to muscles. What muscles? The muscles that are involved in flexion, primarily of the upper extremities. So again, red nucleus, to give you guys some context, at the level of the superior colliculus, it crosses ventral tegmental decussation, moves its way downwards through the rest of the midbrain, pons, medulla, goes into the spinal cord and the lateral white columns, and then gives off axons. It terminates on the, upper, uh, the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord that are primarily serving the muscles of the upper extremities for flexion. That's the rubrospinal tract, okay? Next thing that we have to talk about here. So another really important structure that is involved here is going to be the oculomotor nerve. Now, if you guys remember, we went into so much detail in an individual video about the oculomotor nerve or the cranial nerve three. What I want you guys to remember is just, because this is a lot of questions that they can ask on exams, and it's also important clinically when we talk about midbrain lesions. The third cranial nerve, if you remember, it supplies, it has its general somatic efferent fibers. Those general somatic efferent fibers are supplying the skeletal muscles of the eye. And if you guys remember that mnemonic, right, or they had like a little thing, LR6, SO4, pretty much, and then all the rest, three, that's kind of the easiest way to remember the muscles that are supplied. All right, so we covered the superior rectus, we covered the inferior rectus. What else? It got the, it's got that medial rectus, baby. All right, so we got the medial rectus. Remember that medial rectus it helps with adduction of the eyeball, so like, <laughs> like one of these things. So it helps with that kind of motion, adduction. Then you got the inferior oblique. And remember, the obliques pretty much tell you like opposite of what they, you would think that they would do. So they help to elevate the eyeball and they help to extort, so kind of move the eyeball like this. So extortion, remember superior oblique was depression and intortion, inferior oblique is elevation, extortion. The last one is the eyelid, you know, the, the, the levator palpebra superioris. I'm not writing all that down, so we're gonna put levator palpebra superioris, okay? And that helps to just elevate the upper eyelid. So these are the extraocular skeletal muscles. That's supplied by the general somatic efferents of the oculomotor nerve. The general visceral efferents supplied by the Edinger-Westphal nucleus, which are those parasympathetic fibers, are supplying the sphincter pupillae, right? So it's gonna supply the pupil. And when it supplies that pupil, it supplies the sphincter pupillae, which helps to play a role within constriction of the pupil. So it plays a role in pupillary constriction. It also supplies this muscle here. So we supplied the pupil, the sphincter pupillae, and then we're gonna supply the ciliaris. And remember the ciliaris pulls on those ciliary zonules or the suspensory ligaments, which helps to change the shape of the lens to accommodate it. Now remember, what does the ciliaris do? It pulls on those uh, ciliary zonules or the suspensory ligaments, which helps to change the shape of the lens, which we call accommodation. But what does it accommodate for? Near vision or far vision? It accommodates for near vision, okay? So these are the things that I want you guys to know primarily when it comes to that third cranial nerve. So we got that. Let's move on to the next thing, which is the medial longitudinal fasciculus. All right, so the next structure I wanna talk about just overall function is the medial longitudinal fasciculus, okay? All right, so you guys remember that structure, okay? Remember we had, we talked about that with the vestibular cochlear nerve. Remember the vestibular cochlear nerve picks up sensations, right? From the inner ear, primarily from the, what structure? Remember we have, the cristae ampullaris, right, which is in that semicircular canals, the ampullae, semicircular canals, they come up and provide stimulation to what structures? They provide stimulation to the vestibular nuclei within the kind of like that medulla pons junction, okay? What happens here is when they stimulate these vestibular nuclei, you guys remember what happens is is they come up and they stimulate the sixth cranial nerve, right? So they're gonna stimulate that sixth cranial nerve. Once they stimulate the sixth cranial nerve, what happens is the sixth cranial nerve will then do what? It'll kind of cross over here, right? 
and move upwards. So it'll kind of move upwards and give a stimulation to the third cranial nerve. So again, vestibular cochlear nerve will lead to stimulation to the vestibular nuclei. The vestibular nuclei will give off stimulation to the sixth cranial nerve. The sixth cranial nerve will then give off its axon. Some of the axons will then move upwards on the contralateral side to the third cranial nerve. Same thing on this side. Your vestibular nucleus is gonna stimulate this side of the sixth cranial nerve. From that sixth cranial nerve, it's gonna give off it's some axons that are going to ascend upwards, and these are going to give stimulation to the contralateral third nerve nucleus. Okay, so now we have, again, we have the stimulation from the vestibular cochlear nerve to the vestibular nuclei to the sixth cranial nerve, who will cross over and supply the contralateral third nerve. And for vertical saccadic movement, it can also supply the trochlear nerve. So this is what I want you to remember. Whenever you're kind of moving your head to the right, your uh, vestibular nuclei will help to coordinate movements of the eyes appropriately. So if I move my head to the right, my eyes are going to kind of beat to the left. Well, in order to do that, I might need the lateral rectus on one side to move in a specific way, while the medial rectus of the other eye moves in the opposite direction, right? So whenever I move my head to the right, when I do that, my eyes are going to beat to the left. So the left lateral rectus will have to contract and the right medial rectus will have to contract. Okay, so that's kind of how this all plays a role. So again, what is this blue structure here moving up through the midbrain to connect the trochlear, third nerve, and sixth nerve? This whole thing right here is called the medial longitudinal fasciculus. This would be the left medial longitudinal fasciculus, and this one would be the right medial longitudinal fasciculus. Okay, so it helps to control what's called the vestibulo-ocular reflex or coordinated movement of third, fourth, and sixth nerve nucleus. Okay, so that covers that guy. Let's move on to the next thing. All right, so the last thing that I want to talk about, since we pretty much talked about everything else, and again, we already kind of went into a decent amount of detail on the pretectal nucleus. If you guys want more detail on that one, go watch our video on the pupillary light reflex. It gives more information on that. But again, just wanted you to know kind of the overall direct and consensual response that it's involved in. Last thing that I want to talk about is the superior colliculus. And we've already kind of talked a little bit about this one, but again, to give you guys a little bit of orientation, here is a kind of like a little a frontal section or coronal sectioning of the kind of the brain stem and spinal cord. So again, here you have the midbrain, pons, medulla, spinal cord. And if you guys remember, here's our cerebellum, right? So this is obviously superior colliculus and this is inferior colliculus. And again, if you guys want, they might sometimes ask questions about this on like an exams. What is the name of all four of these collectively called together? And they call this, here, we'll write it down here. It's called the corpora quadrigemina. Okay? But again, the most posterior portion, again, of that midbrain, like we said right here, that's our tectum. Okay? But again, all four of these little structures are called the corpora quadrigemina. Now, if you guys remember, we said that the inferior colliculi are getting stimulation from the ears. So we'll just write down ears, right? So they're getting information from the auditory pathway. And what happens is we already said that the inferior colliculus will send information to the superior colliculus. Well, where else does the superior colliculus get information? We said that the superior colliculus has come up to this diagram here on the sagittal section. Again, superior colliculus, inferior colliculus. We said the superior colliculus gets information from the visual system. So if you have a visual stimulus from the retina, these fibers can connect to the superior colliculus. Guess what that is called whenever you have a connection from the retina uh, as well as other structures. So you'll have stimulation from the visual cortex and you can have stimulation from the frontal eye fields. So again, you'll have frontal eye field, visual cortex, and even stimulation from the retina. And these things will converge onto the superior colliculus. That connection between these to the superior colliculus is called the brachium of the superior colliculus. Now, once the superior colliculus is stimulated, guess what it can do again, guys? It can send its descending fibers to nuclei within the brainstem to control movement of the eye. So your third, your fourth, your sixth nerve nuclei to control movement of the eyes. And then it can also send axons down to the spinal cord, which will go to muscles of the head and the neck. So to give you guys a little bit of information from this, again, 
superior colliculus le receives a visual stimulus. So if Kate Upton's kind of walking down the street and you're like, mm, 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 you're moving your head and your eyes in that direction, okay? That's what it's responding to. Then let's say her boyfriend's yelling, hey, you <laughs> then look in his direction, right? Because the inferior colliculus is stimulated. When he's stimulated, he tells the superior colliculus and says, hey, move your eyes now in the direction of where that auditory stimulus is coming from, okay? So that is kind of the whole function of this uh, superior colliculus. It helps with reflexive movements of the head and the eyes in response to a visual, inferior colliculus movement of the head and the eyes with response to a auditory sensation. Okay, and again, it sends these fibers down as what? Remember what happens here? Superior colliculus will send it will cross and it'll descend downwards into the axons here and go out to the muscles. What is this tract here? As it remember, they have the dorsal tegmental decussation and then descends downwards as the tectospinal tract. Okay. So guys, we covered every single structure here that we can talk about within the midbrain that is more clinically relevant. All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video, we talked about the midbrain and we covered a ton of information. We talked about the anatomy. We talked about a lot of the physiology and functions related to the midbrain. Okay, and I know it was a lot of stuff. I know it was very long and very detailed, but I hope it made sense. I hope you guys did enjoy it. And I hope you guys learned a lot from it. In another video, we'll get into more detail on the midbrain lesions like Weber and Benedict and Claudet and even Perinaud syndrome. Because now that we got the foundation down, we should be able to completely understand the pathophysiology. So guys, I hope you guys liked this video. If you guys did, hit that like button, subscribe, comment down in the comment sections. Go check out in the description box, we have links to our Facebook, our Instagram, our Patreon, everything that you guys would want to connect with us. We would appreciate it. We love you, Ninja Nerds. And as always, until next time.